Okay, so today we're going to uh, discuss, as I said, uh, kind of the context of, of Middle English literature and medieval literature more broadly, and the distinction between Middle English versus medieval is, is um, uh, we'll, we'll look at in a second. Um, okay, so we're going to look at the historical context. Um, we'll look at the historical context from since last week we looked at the historical context basically from uh, Roman, uh, Roman occupation of, of Britain to uh, Anglo-Saxon uh, Anglo -Saxon invasions. Now we'll look at basically very quickly, very quickly, Anglo-Norman Anglo uh, England, and then concentrating a bit more on kind of the crisis of the late Middle Ages, the 14th century, a, a lot going on there. And that's really what what uh, is uh, is the immediate context for Chaucer. Then we're gonna broaden out to more of the history of ideas. So the next three sections refer more to the intellectual history of medieval thought, literature, um, and, uh, and, and theological thinking more broadly. So we'll talk about what's called the medieval synthesis. That's the medieval synthesis of the traditions of, of uh, classical Greeks and Rome with, so a tradition of philosophic reason, science, uh, with the Judeo-Christian tradition of, of deference to divine revelation, so to speak. Um, and the Middle Ages affected this, this synthesis, this, this kind of uh, compromise between those two traditions uh, that uh, was, was later severed by, by the modern age, so to speak. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the medieval cosmos, understanding of the universe, humans' place in it. Um, we'll look at, uh, very quickly, Boethius' Consolation of Philosophy. So this is a work uh, that was immensely uh, um, influential during the Middle Ages. Chaucer himself uh, wrote a translation of, of this work. Uh, as did many others. Um, so it, it has a, a lasting appeal throughout the Middle Ages. And then we'll look at the very short poem, Truth, that I asked you to read um, for today. The, uh, the poem is, is kind of a good uh, primer, so to speak, of the Middle Ages in, in, uh, in terms of its, the, the ideas of the Middle Ages that are expressed in that, that poem. So, uh, <clears throat> so uh, you'll remember this slide uh, in terms of the, the literary period that we're gonna be covering in this course. We're gonna be discussing today Middle English, the immediate context of Chaucer, within the historical context of Anglo-Norman to the Middle English period. But in terms of the history of ideas, we're gonna basically talk about the ideas that um, were the foundation of this whole period from around 500 or 450 to, to 1500, or, or, or in this, this, this particular articulation, 1485, the, the entire medieval period. Okay, um, so let's begin with the Anglo-Norman uh, period. Uh, basically 1066, uh, kind of a date that, one of those historical dates that people are always called upon to, to remember for the Battle of Hastings, uh, the, with the Norman conquest with this decisive battle of England. Um, so the Normans come from obviously Norman B, uh, and they were like the Anglo-Saxons, Anglo-Saxons descendants of Germanic uh, tribes. Uh, and who had seized those areas of northern France uh, a couple of centuries earlier. And uh, Norman, uh, as, as the slide indicates, is, is, a, is a condensation of, of Norsemen. So they are uh, indicating they're, uh, they're uh, coming from uh, those northern uh, European regions. They uh, adopted the French language when they, when they went, uh, when they uh, migrated to uh, what we now call Normandy. 
uh, as well as the Christian religion. So the French language was, was this particular Norman dialect of French at the time. And that's what they brought with them when they invaded and ended up taking over the rule of England. <clears throat> so uh, with Norman rule, uh, old, the old English language and literature declined as, uh, as the language of the court became this, this Norman dialogue dialect of French. <clears throat> uh, so uh, Geoffrey of uh, Monmouth is, is uh, a great, kind of an outstanding author at this period, a Welsh cleric, uh, the history of the kings of Britain written in Latin, uh, uh, is, a, is a monument uh, for the this Anglo-Norman period in the sense that uh, it really roots the history of Britain in this legendary figure named Brutus. Can people hear me now? Uh, can I get a thumbs up if I'm being heard? Okay, good. I think I had a connection issue there for a second. I apologize. So we'll return to that. Uh, we'll return to the um, presentation. Um, so, so Geoffrey of Monmouth's um, History of the Kings of Britain roots the, the rulers of Britain, so these Celtic rulers of, of, the, uh, of Britain before the Anglo-Saxons, gives us really our only record of, of, of some of these figures, basically legendary, and he's, he traces their uh, lineage back to this Brutus of Troy, so he gives it a, a classical uh, a root. Um, and uh, the other takeaway there is it, it's this uh, uh, connection of Britain to the Arthurian tradition. So uh, it uh, uh, is the first kind of popular rec record that we have of this Arthurian legend. Um, and he says that, uh, that Arthur is this figure that uh, battled against Anglo-Saxon invaders. So, uh, uh, so we have a question here from Atifa Munchi. Wasn't he the one who proved that Arthur wasn't real, uh, says Atifa. So uh, to my knowledge, that's not the case. No, I, to my knowledge, Geoffrey of Monmouth uh, uh, felt that put Arthur in this kind of dynasty of kings that battled that battled the Anglo-Saxon rulers and that this was uh, kind of proven or disproven much later, let's say uh, centuries later. That's, uh, thank you. Um, part of the offshoot of these Arthurian traditions um, were these Arthurian romances, they're called. So romance uh, for, um, uh, for the French term, just for basically novel. Or, or story, um, they they involve a uh, this this code of chivalry, which the code of chivalry uh, we, don't, we won't go into this too much. Just basically that these these knights have to follow a certain unwritten code that in, that involved uh, uh, fighting for what is deemed just. Um, uh, deferring to the lady, so to speak, of the court. Um, in its, its literary, uh, uh, its literary expression finds uh, its, its highest expression in what's called courtly love conventions, which we will talk about a little bit more when we talk about Elizabethan sonnets. So these courtly love conventions are expressed in 
these Arthurian rom romances, so, uh, so knights who are questing, but always deferential to these ladies. It becomes this, this, this uh, relation of knight serving a, a lady of the court in a, in a pure and chaste way is always bordering on the, on the sexual and the adulterous. Uh, of course, uh, Guinevere and, and Lancelot are, are examples for those of you who know the, the Arthurian tradition. Um, it's always bordering on the um, on the lustful, so to speak, uh, even though it has it is within the code of chivalry, supposed to be based on honor, respect, and kind of a, a pure spirit. Um, and then in the Elizabethan sonnets, that's given an expression in a love lyric, as opposed to these uh, Arthurian romances, which are long. Uh, episodic narratives, uh, whereas a love lyric, you know, 14 lines, just a little snapshot of, of uh, two, two people who are, who are in love. So we'll see that, as I said, when we, we talk about the Elizabethan sonnets. So there, as I said, kind of a snapshot of, of a few things to, in the background of Anglo-Norman French. We're not reading material from that period. Um, we have uh, just it will be important for a couple of reasons. Uh, that period, uh, we're gonna we're gonna need to keep it in mind when we dig into the Chaucer a bit more in the next lecture. We'll talk about the the shift in the language in the next lecture and Anglo Norman uh, the Anglo Norman occupation of, of England is is a it's a big uh, impetus for a shift in the language. <clears throat> um, also, as I said, it, it's important in terms of um, uniting that literary tradition with French literary traditions of, of, of romance. Um, now, the 14th century, as I said, the immediate context of Chaucer, so, so a couple of centuries after the uh, uh, Anglo-Norman, uh, sorry, the, uh, the Norman conquest, um, 14th century se sees a series of crises, so it's often called the late medieval crisis. Um, so beginning from the beginning of the 14th century, there's a, 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 a few years of severe famines in, in several countries across Europe. So uh, millions of deaths due to this great famine. There, uh, there are the black, uh, this bubonic plague or black death that we'll talk about. There's, uh, as, as we'll see in the next slide, a, a papal schism. There's the beginning of the Hundred Years' War between England and and uh, and. English and French uh, uh, dynasties over the rule of France. Um, uh, because of these uh, various turmoils, including the uh, Black Death, there are popular uprisings in England. It, it's 1381 and referred to as the Peasants' Revolt, uh, and, and that's that's indicated on the next slide. So, so a lot going on. Uh, a, a period of crisis, a period of, let's say, transition in, in a number of respect, respects because of these crises, crises. So questions of deference to ecclesiastical or church hierarchy because of uh, a growing uh, appreciation of, of, of the corruption and uh, this uh, kind of hypocrisy of some church offices. Uh, the, and the pap underlined, again, or, or brought to a head by that papal schism. So there were two, two uh, uh, competing claims to the papacy, so one in Avignon, one in Rome. <clears throat> uh, there is uh, also coming to a head are uh, claims of the peasants to, to have... Uh, uh, Let's say a greater stake economically, so it's less a political struggle than an economic one. These people are starving, whether it's the famine, etc. And then after the uh, the Black Death, uh, they're they're uh, they can charge more for their labor. So the labor labor market is the labor market itself is upended. Uh, fewer laborers, so so it's a supply demand issue. You know, the, the demand for the laborers. Is relatively constant, and uh, that the laborers have been thinned out, so the ones that are remaining can charge more. Basically, uh, also the, the land has been vacated, so they're they're uh, inheriting or or taking over uh, tracts of land and empowering themselves, so to speak. So so these lead to these popular uprisings. So what on the one hand, 
a social, uh, social economic uh, transitionary period, but also uh, a theological one or ecclesiastical one question of the church. I want to <clears throat> get a sense of the Black Plague just because normally uh, we could focus on any one of these as, as speaking to us in our own human condition, but uh, um, the, uh, I want to turn to the author's introduction to Boccaccio's Decameron uh, quickly. Uh, uh, so Decameron, so uh, let me back up. Who's Boccaccio? Boccaccio, uh, author uh, earlier in the 14th century, uh, writing uh, uh, this Decameron in the 1350s. Um, uh, Decameron stands for, uh, or comes from Greek for, for 10 days. Uh, it is a frame narrative, much as Chaucer's Canterbury Tales is. In fact, Canterbury Tales can be seen as, as borrowing uh, quite extensively from the frame narrative that we see in Decameron. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll talk, uh, uh, when we talk about Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, we'll, we'll talk about what a frame narrative is. So, uh, so Boccaccio, Italian author, writing in Florence in the 13th, 50s, lived through the Black Plague that hit it uh, in 13, 1348, um, and has a very haunting description in uh, his author's introduction, in the beginning of, of this work, of the effect of the plague in Florence. And as I said, given our uh, pandemic context, it's one of these little vignettes that uh, I think can stand out for us. Uh, it also kind of brings home what we're talking about there. So this is from Decameron Web. If you want to find this online, I just threw it into a Word document. Um, let's see here. I'll try to share that item. There we go. Um, <clears throat> so uh, as I said, from this is from uh, Decameron Web. Uh, and uh, thrown into Word document so I could read it a bit more easily. Um, it's it's a few pages. I'll, we'll just we'll go through this, and I, I may pause to make a few comments. Okay. Um, as often, most gracious ladies. Uh, so the the intended audience here is is is, is uh, gracious ladies apparently. Uh, as I bethink me, how compassionate you are by nature. One and all, I do not disguise from myself that the present work must seem to you to have but a heavy and distressful prelude, in that it, bear, it bears upon its very front what must needs revive the sorrowful memory of the late mortal pestilence, the course whereof was grievous not merely to eyewitnesses, but to all who in any other wise had cognizance of it. But I would have you know that you need not therefore be fearful and read further as if your reading were ever to be accompanied by sighs and tears. This horrid beginning will be to you even such as to wayfarers is a steep and rugged mountain, beyond which stretches a plain most fair and delectable, which the toil of the ascent and descent does not serve to render more agreeable to them. So the <clears throat> so it's gonna have a, a rough beginning because uh, they're gonna he's gonna talk about the plague. But uh, it's going to uh, lead to uh, to um, uh, an, uh, an idyllic pasture, so to speak, and uh, and then again, if we're paralleling, think think keep in mind the the beginning of Canterbury Tales is is less horrid. It's m more of a normal kind of social situation that they they, they uh, travelers meeting at an inn. There's no black plague that that we'll see as as we'll see down here. It's quite horrible, uh, but. Uh, there's the same sense that this existence is not here, is not to be enjoyed, it's to be used on the way to our true home, uh, heavenly home, let's say an afterlife, a divine, a divine directedness to, to, to something else, so to speak. Um, for as the last degree of joy brings with it sorrow, so misery has ever its sequel of happiness. To this brief exordium of woe, Brief, I say, inasmuch as it can be put within the compass of a few letters, succeed forth with the sweets and delights which I have promised you, and which, perhaps, had I not done so, were not to have been expected from it. In truth, had it been honestly possible to guide you whither I would bring you by a road less rough than this will be, I would gladly have done so. 
but because without this review of the past, it would not be in my power to show you, to short, sorry, to show how the matters of which you will hereafter read came to pass, I am almost bound of necessity to enter upon it if I would write of them at all. I, I don't know if we're to take the author seriously there. But he's, he's saying there's no other way to tell these stories. So the, basically he's, the, the context is the plague in Florence, 10 noble, uh, seven, seven uh, women, three men, uh, of, of noble stature decide let's get out of here they go to this country villa and they spend 10 days each of them telling a tale every day so so 10 times 10 there's there's a hundred tales so each of the 10 characters tells a tale per day um, he's saying that there's no way to get to these great tales which which will he's saying be of, of some sort of um, uh, some sort of moral instruction for them, if uh, without describing this context, uh, perhaps, but I, I think the context then must be part of the moral instruction. Um, I say then that the years of the beatific incarnation of the Son of God had reached the tale of 1348. So it was the year was 1348, when in the illustrious city of Florence, the fairest of all the cities of Italy, uh, I would agree, I've been there, it's a very beautiful city. There, uh, there made its appearance that deadly pestilence, which, whether disseminated by the influence of celestial bodies or sent upon us mortals by God, in his just wrath by way of retribution for our iniquities, had had its origin some years before in the East. So notice there, um, I, I've highlighted that just in the sense that uh, you, you can see that we're, 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 at the cusp of, of the Italian Renaissance in the sense that the question of whether it had natural causes is, is asked openly, so to speak. Uh, I think within the medieval mindset, ultimately it would be just unquestioned that, yeah, God sent it, we must have done something wrong. We can try to understand it, we can use reason, but God definitely did this for, re uh, and, and for some sort of, whether it's for retrib retribution, what have you, there's some sort of plan in this. Here it's a question, maybe it just had natural causes. <clears throat> Whence, after destroying an innumerable multitude of living beings, it had propagated itself without respite from place to place and so calamitously had spread into the West. In Florence, despite all that human wisdom and forethought could devised to avert it, as the cleansing of the city from many impurities by officials appointed for the purpose, the refusal of entrance to all sick folk, and the adoption of many precautions for the preservation of health. So it doesn't matter if you close the airports, it doesn't matter if you socially distance or what have you, there's not much human forethought can do to stop it, uh, so to speak, if we want to uh, tr translate it to our own predicament, according to Boccaccio. Despite also humble supplications addressed to God and often repeated both in public procession and otherwise, so neither, neither human wisdom or rational calculation nor uh, kind of divine supplication or prayer or, or religious rites, neither of these were effective. Um, by, the, uh, by the devout towards the beginning of the spring of the said year, the doleful effects of the pestilence began to be horribly apparent by symptoms that showed as if miraculous. Not such were they as in the East, where, so in the East, it was a different type of manifestation of the disease, where an issue of blood from the nose was a manifest sign of, ine of inevitable death. But in men and women alike, it first betrayed itself by the emergence of certain tumors in the groin or the armpits, some of which grew as large as a common apple, others as an egg, <clears throat> some more, some less, with the common folk called gaviocioli, I don't know Italian, that's my, my guess, from the two uh, said parts of the body, this deadly gaviocciolo uh, soon began to propagate and spread itself in all directions in, indifferently, after which the, uh, the form of the malady began to change. Black spots or livid uh, making their appearance in many cases on the arm or the thigh or elsewhere, 
now few and large, now minute and numerous. So it's a black spot. That's where we get the expression black plague from the, from the black spot that would manifest themselves. And, uh, and uh, another, the other Italian word for gaboccioolo were, uh, were uh, bubono or uh, bubo. So the uh, bubonic plague. Um, which maladies seem to set entirely at naught both the art of the physician and the virtues of physic? So, so medical art is, is useless. Indeed, whether it was that the disorder was of, of a nature to defy such treatment or that the physicians were at fault. Besides the qualified, there was now a multitude both of men and women who practiced without having received the slightest tincture of medical science. So there's, there's because of the demand, there's a, there, there are many of these uh, new people who are, who are practicing medicine and, and maybe without the same training. And in being in ignorance of its source, failed to apply the proper remedies. In either case, not merely were those that recovered few, but almost all within three days from the appearance of the said symptoms sooner or later died. And in most cases, without any fever or attendant malady. Moreover, the virulence of the pest was greater by reason that intercourse was apt to convey it from what from the sick to the whole, just as a fire devours things dry or greasy when they are brought uh, close to it, so the very quick spreads very quickly. Nay, the evil went yet further, for not merely by speech or association with the sick was the malady communicated to the healthy with consequent peril of common death. But any that touched the clothes of the sick or aught else that had been touched or used by them seemed thereby to contract the disease. So marvelous sounds that which I have now to relate that had not many, and I among them, observed it with their own eyes, I had hardly dared to credit it, much less to set it down in writing, though I had had it from the lips of credible witness. So, uh, <clears throat> so the, even the stories, the stories that are about to be told in some cases quite fanciful, they, are, they in, a, in a sense, are, are going to be more easily believed than what in reality happened in Florence. I say then that such was the energy of the contagion of the said pestilence, that it was not merely propagated from man to man, but what is more startling, it was frequently observed that things which had belonged to one sick or dead of the disease if touched by some other living creature, not of human species, were the occasion, not merely of sickening, but of, uh, of an almost instantaneous death, where of my own eyes, as I said a little before, had cognizance one day among others by the following experience. The rags of a poor man who had died in, of the disease being strewn about the open street, two hogs came thither and after as is their wont, uh, no little trifling with their snouts, took the rags between their teeth and tossed them to and fro about their chaps, whereupon almost immediately they gave a few turns and fell down dead, as if by poison, upon the rags which in an evil hour they had disturbed. Um, in which circumstances, not to speak of many others, of a similar or even graver complexion, diverse apprehensions and imaginations were engendered in the minds of such as were left alive. Okay, so the response of, of, of those alive is, is, is um, kind of the moral here. It's uh, how, how humans, how let's say the limits of human morality in some, in some senses. Uh, <clears throat> inclining almost all of them to, to the same harsh resolution, to wit, to shun and abhor all contact with the sick and all that belong to them, thinking thereby to make their own health secure. So I think Boccaccio is uh, framing this because he's saying basically what the takeaway from the, from the plague is, um, is how when, when this type of event occurs, how kind of base selfishness um, and uh, a base self-regard as opposed to kind of human compassion overrules, uh, uh, overruled everyone there. Among, and then he, he's gonna go on to describe four types of approaches that he saw, that four types of response that people had. Among whom there were those, so the first, first, first uh, cohort, so to speak, 
there were those who thought that to live temperately and avoid all excess would count for much as a preservative against seizures of this kind. Wherefore, they banded together and dissociating themselves from all others, formed communities in houses where there were no sick and lived a separate and secluded life, which they regulated with the utmost care, avoiding every kind of luxury, but eating and drinking very moderately of the most delicate viands and the finest wines, holding converse with none but one another, lest tidings of sickness or death should reach them and diverting their minds with music and such other delights as they could devise. So this is, I guess, the group that bakes sourdough bread today, you know, in the pandemic and sets aside, you know, does it work at regime? Uh, and then there's another group um, uh, that, that kind of does the opposite, they go into excess. So others, the bias who, whose mind was in the opposite direction, maintain that to drink freely, uh, frequent places of public resort, and take their pleasure with song and revel, sparing to satisfy no appetite and to laugh and mock at no event was the sovereign remedy for so great an evil. And that, they, and that which they affirmed, they also put in practice. So as far as they were able, resorting day and night, now to this tar tavern, now to that, drinking with an entire disregard of rule or measure, and by preference, making the houses of others as it were their inns. So they're even using other people's houses if they saw in them aught that was particularly to their taste or liking, uh, which they were readily able to do because the owners, seeing death imminent, had become as reckless of their own property as of their lives. So either the houses are empty or, um, or, or people have abandoned these homes because, uh, because they see death coming. So that most of the houses were open to all comers and no distinction was observed between the stranger who presented himself and the rightful Lord. Thus, adhering ever to their inhuman determination to shun the sick as far as possible, they ordered their life. In this extremity of our city's suffering and tribulation, the venerable authority of laws, human and divine, was abased and all but totally dissolved. The lawfulness break, is breaking right down. For lack of those who should have administered and enforced them, most of whom, like the rest of the citizens were either dead or sick or so hard vested for servants that they were unable to execute any office whereby even man, every man was free to do what was right in his own eyes. So you see uh, the Boccaccio is in that kind of a tradition there is a, of, 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 uh, of a number of articulations of experiences of plague. So another famous one is Thucydides, if you ever, if you ever come across Thucydides, so in the um, in Athens uh, during the Peloponnesian War. So Athens was under siege by the Spartans. So as this terrible plague breaks out in Athens, again, a third of the population from, from some estimates uh, uh, killed by this plague. Thucydides' description of that plague is very similar, you know, with the moral breakdown, uh, as well as the, uh, the, this question of lawlessness, uh, 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 that there's, there's no one to administer these laws. Um, and again, you know, uh, I highlight these, you know, I, I, I jokingly compared them to the pandemic, um, you know, but we're, you know, obviously for a couple of reasons, we need to, we can learn from the past uh, and maybe try to respectfully disagree with Hegel. As Hegel had said, uh, uh, Hegel, uh, uh, early 19th century philosopher, German philosopher, had said, one learns from history that, that no one learns from history. So his point there, you know, like, all, the only thing you learn from history is that, it, that it's going to repeat itself because no one learns from it. Um, uh, and maybe that's the case, but if we can respectfully disagree, can we learn from the past that uh, to, can we learn from a Boccaccio, can we learn from a Thucydides that these can be tendencies of the human condition to respond to these types of situation in, in lawlessness, abandoning others to, in order to secure the good of the self, these, these types of things and, and how, they, how they ultimately can be destructive of a, of a society. Um, the third response was between that, I'll, I'll kind of skip through that one. Uh, the fourth response uh, was to leave the city. So uh, I'll, I'll remind you again that <clears throat> This is what the actual tale tellers in the Decameron do. Some again, the most sound perhaps in judgment as they were also the most harsh in temper. So the most, 
maybe the most selfish because they just said, oh, okay, I'll get out of here and let everyone else die. Uh, affirmed that there was no medicine for the disease superior or equal in efficacy to flight, following which prescription a multitude of men and women negligent of all but themselves deserted their city, their houses, their estates, their kinfolk, their goods, and went into voluntary exile or migrated to the country parts as if God in visiting men with this pestilence in requital of their iniquities would not pursue them with his wrath wherever they might be but intended the destruction of such alone as remained within the circuit of the walls of the city, or deeming perchance that it was now time for all to flee from it and that its last hour was come. Um, and then, so generally speaking, the next paragraph is basically generally speaking what this, what this leads to is, is such, a, such a decline in, in moral treatment that even one, in their cases where one's own children, so parents abandoning their own children. Of the adherents of these diverse opinions, not all died. Neither did all escape, but rather there were of each sort and in every place, many that sickened and by those who retained their health were treated after the example which they themselves, while whole, had set. So when they got sick, they were treated the same way. So people are abandoned, you know, they're not, to, they're not being cared for. Being everywhere left to languish in almost total neglect, tedious were it to recount how citizen avoided citizen, how among neighbors was scarce found any that showed fellow feeling for another, how kinsfolk held aloof and never met, or but rarely enough, that this sore affliction entered so deep into the minds of men and women that in the horror thereof, brother was forsaken by brother, nephew by uncle, brother by sister, and oftentimes the husband by wife. Nay, what is more and scarcely to be believed, fathers and mothers were bound to abandon their own children, untended, unvisited, to their fate as if they had been strangers. So if the, if the children got it, they didn't want to be near to the children. Uh, I skipped the section there, uh, but uh, it, it goes on. It's quite horrifying about, you know, how the numbers of, of dead were piling up, corpses were piling up. They had to they had to use mul put multiple corpses in, in single graves graves and, and pile up the bodies on, on the carts that were pulling them out of down the streets. The condition of the lower and then I'll just highlight this last paragraph. So the the, the here kind of the lesson and, and again we, we seem to be seeing see, seeing evidence of this as well as the differential impact of, of something like this on 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 people based on their economic context. So the lower and perhaps in great, me in great measure uh, of the middle ranks of the people showed even worse and more deplorable. For deluded by hope and constrained by poverty, they stayed in their quarters. So they didn't have the luxury to head out of town to a villa. Uh, and, uh, they stayed in their quarters in their houses where they sickened by thousands a day and being without service of any kind were, so to speak, irredeemably devoted to the death uh, which overtook them. Many died daily or nightly in the public streets. Of many others who died at home, the departure was hardly observed by their neighbors until the stench of their putrefying bodies carried the tidings. And what with their corpses and the corpses of others who died on every hand, the whole place was a sepulcher. So uh, I, very, as I said, sobering um, depiction of, of the, of the plague by, uh, by Boccaccio and um, uh, gives us a sense again of the context and, uh, uh, and, and maybe kind of a kind of a relativizes maybe the suffering we're going through you know if, if humanity could make make it through that you know I, I'm hopeful that we'll make it through through uh, this pandemic no problem um, but also amazing in terms of this a couple of decades earlier this happening in in europe and, and having recurrent waves for for for, for decades and, and 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 actual centuries really um a flowering of literature was still able to take place in the late 1300s so uh, that in england and already taking place as we see in boccaccio uh, that is also amazing I'm just going to make sure.
sure I share this again. Um, <clears throat> so I mentioned the, uh, the Hundred Years' War, I mentioned the Papal Schism, and this flourishing of Middle English literature I referred to with the Pearl Poet. The Pearl Poet is uh, an anonymous author. He wrote the, the Pearl, the name of that poem, but also the uh, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, maybe people have heard of, Geoffrey Chaucer, Canterbury Tale, William Langland, who wrote Piers Plowman. And Ch with Chaucer in particular, what happens um, because of his uh, learning uh, both of the Latin classics, so Virgil, Ovid, but also of the Italian Renaissance, in particular Dante, Boccaccio. Um, he, uh, he, he broadens the literary horizons of English literature. So, so um, uh, the, the, the Anglo-Saxon literature that we had read um, has as its roots uh, uh, Germanic, uh, oral, uh, a Germanic oral tradition, uh, that uh, so it's building on those stories with a thin let's say christian overlay so less about the christian mythology but more about the ethos kind of overlaying on those stories um chaucer digs deeply and understands because of his learning and th and, and then others after him uh brings the stories and the the the, the the texts and the, the literary references of the classical tradition uh, to bear uh, more so, and, and, and then in the Renaissance that explodes even further. So I want to <clears throat> turn now to this uh, medieval synthesis that I described between Athens and uh, or the tradition that Athens represents and the tradition that Jer Jerusalem represents. So, uh, so one way of thinking about this, and I'm borrowing this from uh, I'm forgetting the uh, I'm forgetting the author's name, but uh, I'm borrowing this from uh, from uh, from another uh, medievalist. But um, the Western tradition has been likened to a body. So if we think of but having two legs, you know, one one rooted in the Greco-Roman tradition, one leg, and uh, and one leg, the Judeo-Christian tradition, and then what what the kind of the foundation, what 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 links it to the ground, and then the, the Middle Ages are this torso that that kind of brings them together and, and unites them, and then the arms uh, could be seen as one like the, the Renaissance is, is is a bifurcation again and. and and points down and tries to, to, to reestablish itself in the classical roots. And then the Reformation, this other arm that tries to establish itself or, or reground itself in the, in the Judeo-Christian roots. And then the head being kind of a modernity that, uh, that, um, that uh, is rational and, 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 and uh, tries to, to, to go beyond tradition itself, to think beyond, let's say, merely the limits of the body, so to speak. So what is, the, so these two traditions, so often just, just shortened as Athens and Jerusalem, beginning with Tertullian, so uh, Tertullian is this church father in the second century who had, had this famous question, what does Athens have to do with Jerusalem? So the question, and we'll talk about that question, but basically, what is what is that distinction? Is distinction is between two claims to what is the good life, basically. So if I'm if I think about some of the ultimate one of the ultimate questions would be how do I be what what's the ultimate uh, way in which I should lead my life? How should I be as a person? And, and and I need to look for some sort of guidance there um, uh, so that I can I can. It's, try to live that good life and the first question determining what is the good life um i uh, I, I need to as kind of ascertain what are the different different claims and the uh, the two traditions described here basically are two radically different claims one that uh the good life is one that is is the rationally articulated uh determination of what is you know true uh, uh ultimately scientifically and uh, uh, uh it's questionable to what extent that that can lead to 
di different types of moral paths, but, but the, the, the right approach is for me to rationally try to figure out with unaided human reason uh, the nature of the cosmos and, and thus my place in it. The other one is basically saying, okay, well, human reason is limited. Uh, it can be a guide to some extent, but uh, I'm never going to be able to ascertain the nature of the cosmos, so I'm going to have to defer to some sort of divine revelation. That, that in a nutshell, is, is let's say, the two claims being made. So uh, as this slide tried to, tries to articulate, the two claims have their, have their roots in two co different conceptions of the divine and the, the relation of the divine to being, being or beings in whole, okay? So for the Greeks, uh, the gods, so, so even, even Zeus, uh, exists within a pre-existing cosmos and is subject to the, the is subject to this kind of overarching order of fate. So, so Zeus is, is not, is, is, is not outside of that and, and not determining that, but is one, one force, one, 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 one entity among the cosmos, so to speak. So grounding human life within this framework, um, the good and, and determining what is the good life will be a matter of coming to know the cosmos as a whole or beings as a whole as completely as possible. So this, this leads to philosophy as the Greek response. And then ultimately I would see the science, you know, like the best way to, to, to figure out our way in the world is to analyze and to know uh, the world. Uh, and then the, the Judeo-Christian tradition uh, has a slightly different, well, in its roots, maybe a radically different departure. And uh, one way of understanding that it would be in the, the divine name there. So in Exodus, um, so in the, the Hebrew Bible, the second, uh, second book of the Hebrew Bible, Exodus, uh, Moses <clears throat> says, you know, who, sh who, who should I say sent me? And then in, in 3.14, famously, uh, uh, God gives his name, which could be translated as I shall be what I shall be. So, uh, so in, the, in the Hebrew, it could be in the present tense or in the future tense. So I am what I am, or I will be what I will be. I, I will be what I will be. Uh, I like the future tense translation because it emphasizes the unknowability. The unknowability of the divine. So you may try to, uh, unlike other, let's say, uh, polytheistic uh, religions within uh, in the Middle East, where you could curry the curry uh, power over uh, uh, over divine forces by by uh, by uh, a sacrifice by 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 manipulating uh, uh, physical forces in order to manipulate and control spiritual forces. This is a god that can't be controlled or known. Okay, so. Uh, in this context, for uh, since the Hebrew God stands outside the realm of beings and the cosmos is created by God, has a beginning and So given the fact that uh, God in the Hebrew tradition stands outside of the cosmos, uh, rather than philosophy, the good life is guided by law or covenant. So, so uh, the right way to live is, is a set of, of commandments, a set of laws that are divinely, divinely given. Uh, and religion is, is kind of, rather than philosophy, is the human response. The human response to, to the need to articulate how to live the good life is, is a set of prescriptions for how to follow these divine commandments or covenants. Now, good. Any questions at this point? Um, any questions? Can I get a... Thumbs up if everyone can hear me um, at this point. I had a, yeah, good, thank you. I think I had another um, connection issue for a split second.
So the, the, two, uh, the two traditions, Athens and Jerusalem, what does Athens have to do with Jerusalem, as I said, from, from Tertullian, um, has to do with the value of pagan learning. So, um, you know, these early church fathers are saying, obviously, we need to turn our, our, our attention to studying uh, the, the, uh, the Christian New Testament as well as the Hebrew Bible, what they call the Old Testament. But what do we need to do? Do we need to read Plato? So the question, what does Athens have to do with this? Do we need to read Plato and Aristotle? Do we need to read those uh, classical Greek authors? Um, also has to do ultimately with the competing claims, as, as the last slide tried to indicate, between reason and revelation, so the competing claims to the good life. Um, so it, it, it just it is interesting to note, though, that Christianity itself, so the New Testament itself, shows influences already of the Christian and classical tradition. So, uh, so Luke was, uh, was evidently influenced by Thucydides and, and a number of the, uh, there's a number of evidences of, let's say, Plato in, in the letters. Um, um, and in the second and third centuries, uh, uh, Christians would have different views about how to, to accommodate this, this tradition of Plato and these others, these classical Greek authors that were writing before Christ and before the New Testament. So how do you reconcile those with, with the teachings of Christ? With different responses. One was, as you see there, that the, the, uh, some believe that these, Christ, these Greek authors, such as Plato, were in some way privy to revelation before Christ, were privy to a divine revelation before Christ. Okay. So they were Christians before Christ. And others saw all of that pagan learning as inferior to scripture and, and not to be trusted. And then this, then we get this great medieval synthesis, as, as I mentioned, um, that, that, that tries to see uh, that, that the, the classical authors have a role and reason has a role for, 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 for telling us uh, and, and helping us to articulate what the goals of human life are, but that uh, these philosophers and the classical tradition itself can't get us there, that the only way to get there is, is God or Christ. Uh, then, uh, and as I mentioned here, the, the divine comedy uh, kind of enacts this. So for those of you who may, may have come across aspects of this or, or read, it, read it in its entirety, in the Divine Comedy, it, it opens, and for the first two books, we have Virgil, this, this classic titan of a classical author, Latin uh, author of the Latin epic, um, at the Aeneid, guides Dante the Pilgrim, so a character in, in the Divine Comedy, comedy who shares the name with the author, guides him through the first two stages, through Inferno or Hell, through purgatory up the mountain, and then, uh, but he can go no further after purgatory. After that, Beatrice, which is this, uh, who had died and is this embodiment of, of, of this kind of spiritual perfection, must guide Dante after that. So reason, the classical tradition can take us a certain way, but after that must be abandoned for a, a religious solution. Uh, this, uh, I just wanted to highlight that, uh, as I indicated, there's, there's already in the classical tradition, the two legs of the two legs of the tradition, the Hebrew tradition, the classical tradition, are already in the earliest Christian writings. So St. Paul and the Gospels already have an influence. But in parallel to the early Christian authors, um, Stoicism and Neoplatonism are developing. So this classical tradition is evolving. Um, and then it's only in the Middle Ages that it comes to, to influence Christianity. So early Christianity, the first few hundred years, Stoicism and Neoplatonism are kind of developing in parallel. And then it's kind of incorporated in this period of St. Augustine and, and, and Boethius. Um, <clears throat> so, so Stoicism, I, I just... Uh, Again, for understanding the, the medieval point of departure, kind of an, uh, uh, an important, um, important philosophy, 
Uh, so it begins with this uh, Greek philosopher in the first century, Epictetus, and it distinguish it, the basic point of departure of Stoicism is to distinguish what is in our power and what is not. So, so and it's it's one of these. It's it's, uh, it's it's kind of a, a philosophy that you see it for for self help books now. You, I think I've seen a, a, a book I forget what it's called, but it's got stoic stoic readings for every day. So a little bit for every day, just for you guiding your own life now. It's uh, uh, you find it in the self help section, for instance. So if something's bothering you, whether it's at work or at school or others, your friends, you distinguish between what's in your power to control. So I can't control what the responses of others are. I can't control my wealth. I can't control, uh, I can't even control ultimately my own body. You know, I can try to stay as fit as I can be, but ultimately, you know, should there be disease or aging, uh, these things are beyond one's control. The only thing one can really control is one's response to the world. So one's mental attitude. So um, happiness is achieved by accepting that which is beyond one's control, mentally being apathetic. So that's the historic goal there is apatheia, is, is being um, just taking that with a grain of salt, so to speak, uh, and, uh, and focusing rather on what I do control, my response, my mental attitude. So <clears throat> as I said, um, this becomes uh, uh, via Augustine, but also, but mostly through Boethius, and Boethius is so influential in the Middle Ages, this becomes kind of a guiding philosophy of the Middle Ages as well, and couples with their, their dualism, like the physical world is something I don't control, so the whole physical world is something I don't control, so I should kind of spurn the physical world, forget the physical world, and think about my true home, and and not put a lot of focus on this on this uh, existence. So the medieval cosmos. I'm going to go relatively quickly through this. Um, <clears throat> uh, it's a Ptolemaic universe. You've probably heard this expression before, but it's a or or, or geocentric uh, conception of the the cosmos. Uh, oh come on, the uh, made. So the, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, this conception of the cosmos is, is ordered, hierarchical, it goes from the lowest uh, forms of matter to in the sublunary sphere, so the sphere that is below the moon is that which is physical, changeable, made of four different elements, and ascends through progressive layers to, to uh, uh, these fixed stars, uh, which are eternal and, and, and perfect, and then um, then the Empyrean beyond that, which is which is heaven, and and the prime mover uh, uh, God. So uh, it is hierarchical. It's known. It's it's neat. Things have their place. Um, uh, things have their proper motions. So within the physical world motion is up and down uh, uh, and drawn by what well, we think drawn by gravity but it, it's not because there's external force things are move in straight lines because that's what's their proper nature it's, it's uh, it, the modern con physical conception is of abstract entities moving in an abstract face for, uh, space uh, uh, influenced by these other forces okay so here things have their own proper direction. So why do rocks fall? Because it's natural for them to go down. So they, they, they go to their proper spot in that hierarchy. Why does air go up? Well, it's proper for them, for air to exist higher than the rocks, but not too high. It has a spot where it'll stop. Uh, so a, a different conception, obviously, than our own. Uh, on the right hand, we have uh, this, this, this image is of, um, of uh, the, the Ptolemaic universe uh, with uh, Dante's, uh, Dante's conception of Mount Purgatory and, the, uh, and hell 
uh, as this, this conical chamber at the center of the earth there. So that's, that's from Dante. Uh, also, just I'll highlight that based, kind of building on Aristotle, the medieval thinkers thought of a, a great chain of being. So in addition to the kind of the cosmos like with the stars, uh, the, the different planets, having a certain hierarchy from lowest matter, it's also in, 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 in the, the entities or beings within that, within that cosmos have a chain. So, so from the highest, you know, God, uh, God himself to, to different orders of angels, to humans that are about the middle, then to different sorts of animals, depending on, on how pure they are. Uh, to 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 plants and then to to uh, to rocks to 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 to, to earth uh, and and finally to demons and and Satan who are who are the most rever, re, re, um, removed from the divine. And then this is this hierarchical conception and that things have their own place in the cosmos is reflected in the social order. So in this ideal conception of the Middle Ages, an ideal conception that I will say, and, and looking ahead to the, to the Canterbury Tales, it's an ideal conception only, right? Like in the real world, people, you know, are, it's messy. And, and I think Chaucer is, is this kind of first author that points to the messiness and, and points to uh, the fact that thing, uh, the people and, and relations are not as nearly as neat as this ideal conception. But in this ideal conception, there's three orders uh, of society and the peasants, they should do perform their role. They have, they are by nature, uh, just as rocks have a nature to fall and be at the bottom, so too peasants have a nature to work and they should work. And knights are very good fighters and by nature they should, uh, should be the ones to protect the community. And the priests are are, are, are ones that are best, uh, best positioned to pray and, and, and be the spiritual guides of the community. And one shouldn't, should stay, stick within their role, right? And again, for, so if we look at Chaucer, what we'll call the estate satire. So there's a, these three estates, these three societal functions are, it's, it's a satire of the, the traditional conceptions of these estates. Um, the, uh, uh, I'll just highlight then very quickly the fact that this is, that humans are part of this cosmos. Humans are a microcosm of the macrocosm of the, that is the cosmos. So we are a small cosmos within this large cosmos. We are a micro, small cosm within the large macro cosm. So there's four elements in, in four elements within the sublunary sphere. So the sublunary sphere is made of these four elements according to this conception and they change and they have different mixtures. And that's why the sublunary realm below the moon is one of change and becoming. So above the moon, it's eternal and its proper motion is circle. So the circle is the motion of eternity. So here there's change and it's linear movement and, and uh, the four elements, fire, air, water, and earth are are, four, are, are reflected in four humors or mirrored in the four humors that, that one finds in, in the medieval conception of the human body. And a human character is, is determined by whether one has an excess of, 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 of blood if, and then they will be sanguine so they can be outgoing and open-hearted. And if one has uh, a, a, an excess of yellow bile like fire, they are going to be very hot and fiery and maybe hot tempered. And, and if it's black bile, which is like earth, they're going to be very melancholic and, and, and maybe tend towards to, to the depressive side and so on. Uh, and uh, I won't read this, but this is this conception of the microcosm, the human as microcosm uh, uh, endured for, for centuries, even even into the Renaissance. I'm going to skip the, the constellation of philosophy in the interests of time. Uh, so you have the notes there, but, but so I've, I've skipped a couple of slides that talk about, about who Boethius was, but, but basically 
the work, this influential work that he wrote was written in prison. And he's, he's saying, okay, boy, my, I used to be on top of the world and now I'm in prison for treason. And, you know, things couldn't get much worse. You know, like how, how fortune has changed for me. And then this character, Lady Philosophy, appears, and this, this uh, kind of personification of wisdom comes and, and starts to console him, the consolation of philosophy. And a big part of the consolation there in book two is that don't, you're pinning your hopes to fortune. So you're, you're, you're how, whether you get wealthy, whether you're well off in this world, that is going to change. And this, because this world is changeable, this is a realm of of changing fortunes, and we can't put our faith in that. Um, so th this this fortune is symbolized by this age. It's an ancient symbol uh, used by the Romans as well. It's uh, symbolized with this by this goddess Fortuna spinning this wheel. So at one moment I may find myself on top of the world. Next I'll be down here at the bottom with its spokes driving through me. Um, and no one can control this. We must take a stoic attitude to this. This is not someone in, in, something's, in, in someone's control. One can only control one's attitude towards what happens to one. So the upshot of this is a, a sense of, of dualism, as I mentioned. So uh, the, the goods of this world, so wealth, fame, uh, uh, power, they, they are, uh, they're fickle ruled by, by fortune, which is this, um, this very fickle goddess. And ultimately, uh, the ultimate good is, is, is the divine. Uh, and then and, uh, the goods of this world are temporal, so our, our ultimate good, goodness is timeless, okay? So Chaucer's truth um, is, as I mentioned, kind of this great encapsulation of this medieval world view that, that we kind of described, of this synthesis of, um, of reason and revelation, of, of, of elements of, of, of stoicism that we talked about uh, in terms of, of, of not, not pinning one's hopes on that which is fickle and this part of this world. Uh, this notion of uh, having a true home uh, that, that we can we can aspire to be more angelic, so to speak, in that high, that great chain of being. Uh, in our body form, we, we are we're humans that are in this middle, but our spiritual form can aspire to be, uh, be closer to, to, to God. So, so to, to think of life as a journey, and we'll see that even more so in, in Canterbury Tales. So uh, I tried to summarize here some of the, the kind of the takeaways that we, we'll see from the poem. You know, be satisfied with, with what is given in life, you know, that kind of stoic attitude. Don't put great stock in wealth or power. So it, 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 like all the gifts of fortune, they're, they're fleeting and fickle. Take a stoic attitude to the faults of this world. And our lives have a predetermined purpose in their spiritual uh, uh it, and we have, we're on a journey or pilgrimage to our spiritual home. Um, go back to this. Now, so uh, this is uh, Christopher Cannon reading this uh, Chaucer's Truth. So I, he does a better job than I, I can of reading it in Middle English. And, uh, and then we'll go through it. We'll go through it and, and try to paraphrase it uh, line by line. Truth. Flay from the press and dwell with soft fastness. So feast unto the thing, though it be small. For hard hath hate and cleaning tickleness. Praise hath envy and well blent over all. Savour no more than they behoove a shawl. Rule well thee self that other folk can strayed, and truth thee shall deliver, it is no dread. Tempest thee not all crooked to redress, in trust of her that turneth as a ball. Great rest astaunt in little busyness, beware therefore to spurn against an all. 
Strive not as doth the crooker with the wall. Taunt thyself that tauntest others dead, and truth they shall deliver, it is no dread. That they are sent to save in buxomness, the wrestling for this world axeth a fall. It is none home, it is but wilderness. Forth, pilgrim, forth, for the best oot of thee stall. Knew thee contre, look up, thank God of all. Hold the highway, and let the ghost they led, and truth thee shall deliver, it is no dread. Therefore do vash lave thee non wretchedness, unto the world lave now to be a thrall. Cree him mercy, that of his he goodness may thee of nocht, and in especial, draw unto him, and pray in general, for they, and egg for other, heavenly maid, and truth they shall deliver, it is no dread. So, very well done by Christopher Cannon there. Um, and uh, has a, a certain beauty to it, writ, read in its middle English. It's, uh, is it, some of the, the consonant pronunciation uh, is, is more harsh than, than, than modern English, but has a certain uh, 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 beauty nonetheless. Um, now, next week, i sorry, for the next one on Thursday, the next class, um, I've given for, for Canterbury Tales for the, for the general prologue. So it's a bit longer. Uh, well, it's, it's considerably longer. It's about, uh, I think it's 800 lines or so, as opposed to this, which is, um, uh, which is only uh, in the order of 20. I'm not sure how many lines. Uh, but, so it's considerably longer. But uh, the link I've provided is to a interlinear translation. So it's got the Middle English there, but it also has a modern translation there. So it's fine for you to read that modern translation. Um, but I, for this one, since it's so short, I wanted to get get a sense of the Middle English. Did uh, did people have a chance to read this? What were people's impressions? Maybe let me know if you want to chime in on the um, my letting me know on chat there. Did anyone have any uh, impressions of the? Uh, when they read when they read the poem or impressions of hearing Christopher Cannon read it? Maybe show of hands, did, did people have a chance to read it? Maybe just show of hands, that might be easier. So, uh, so we had a few, so, well, most of you read it. That's good. Um, show again. Show of hands. So clear the old hands if you can. Um, maybe show of hands. Who was let's say maybe overwhelmed by the Middle English aspect of it? Just couldn't make much of it. So it's okay. So good. So we'll go through. Yeah. So many of you. I I, I guess most of you are overwhelmed by the Middle English, and. Um, um, it can be intimidating. I have to admit, when I first encountered this, uh, I think I, I probably had a very similar response. Um, let's go back to this. Uh, so here, let's go through and make sure we're all on the same page, what it's saying. And as I said, it basically provides, uh, in a nutshell, uh, uh, kind of a middle, middle, middle Ages 101 in terms of medieval thinking. So flee through the place, so flee from the crowd. From the crowd, so what, what what others may want you to, to do, and 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 uh, uh, kind of the appeals of don't, don't get sucked in by all those uh, by the bad crowd. You know, it might be what your parents tell you when you're in high school or something like that. And dwell with soothfastness. So so find your home in truth. Peace uh, into the thing. So um, be find in in your position what is sufficient. Be, uh, Suffice, suffice it to say, suffice it, uh, what you have is sufficient, though it be small. For hoarding um, is hateful, for hoard ha hot, and cleaning tickle nits. So climbing, so social climbing and striving is, is in, unstable and fickle. Place hath envy, so the crowd is envious. So it always wants, it's always looking, it's always a game of the 
keeping up with the Joneses. Do people know that expression? So, you know, keeping up with the Joneses. So and so got the new iPhone or whatever people want now or the cool. Right now, I think the one thing I have, like, I always want the coolest fitness watch and so and so's got a better Garmin than I have, you know. So, so that's part of the striving with, with others and, and crowd behavior that can distract us from a more, a more spiritual centeredness and well blent overall. So wealth, well-being, well, I think of wealth is a better, probably better translation, translation. wealth blinds someone overall it blinds one it can can make us focus on physical things as opposed to what's behind them savor no more desire no more savor no more than be behoove so de desire no more than what you ought to have rule well be self that other folk can save so rule so rule yourself before you start to advise others and truth be self shall deliver it is not the so truth will deliver you as a written in the New Testament. And it is don't fear. It is nothing to dread. It is no dread. Tempesty not all crooked to regress. So don't get worked up. Don't get into a storm, a tempest. Um, all, all wrongs to correct. In trust of her that turneth as a ball. Who, who might that be? Don't trust her that turneth as a ball. Any takers on that? Anyone either on the, let me know in the comments or, or any ideas with a hand, let me know if you have a sense of who, who turns as a, in trust of her that turneth as a ball, or let's say turneth as a wheel. Okay, so the, the goddess Fortuna, don't, tr so if you're, if you're trying to get all worked up to, to right this wrong, you're trusting in the realm of fortune that this can somehow be stabilized. And you're trusting in her that turneth as a ball. So that's wrong. So don't trust in her that turneth as a ball, which is, which is the goddess fortune. Great rest stunt and little busyness. So great the restfulness is in, is in, in, in little busyness, you know, so get, getting into others' business. Beware, therefore, to spurn against an awl. So don't kick an, an awl, you know, that sharp kind of digging instrument. So to, to kick uh, against an awl is, is doing all this is like kicking that, that uh, sharp instrument. Strive not as does a cock or with the wall. So it's like, it's like what a, 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 a bull would do if you threw it against the wall. Don't thyself, so overcome oneself so you can overcome others, and truth thee shall deliver, it is not real. So truth will deliver you, it, you have nothing to fear. That thee is sent, that you are sent, that you are here on some sort of life that has a final intention, that you were sent for a reason, receive in obedience. The wrestling for this world acts at the fall. So if you're wrestling for this, if you're striving for this world, you're asking to fall. Here is not home. Here's just a wilderness. Here is none home. Here is mist but wilderness. Forth, pilgrim forth. So go, go forth. You are a pilgrim. So remember, remember the Canterbury Tales. We're looking forward to the Canterbury Tales where they are literally pilgrims. Okay, we'll see next, think for the next class. Fourth best out of the stall. So don't stay here making your home here like a beast. So if, if we make our home in this world, if we remember the great chain of being, humans have options to go up or down that chain of being. We can become more enmeshed in the physical. Our souls are this soul in a body. We can become more enmeshed in the physical. So we descend this chain and we can even ultimately become with one with these demons in hell or we can go forth to our true home so forth best out of the stall know the country so know your country know your home look up thank god of all so you're so you're looking up to that to that ultimate home hold the hay way so hold the upward way the highway right this is also you see this in plato as well and again which is why i think they, these christian Thinkers, these early Christian thinkers felt, you know, you could you could borrow from a, a Plato. 
hold the hay away and let the ghost be laid. So let you be led by your spirit, not by these physical desires. In truth, they shall deliver. It is no dream. And then there's this envoy, so ascending um, to, uh, to, uh, to a friend or, or patron, uh, uh, Phil, Sir Philip de la Vache. So there's kind of a, a play on words there, Vache is cow, right? Um, so therefore thou bash, leave thine old wretchedness. So leave the, your ways of wretchedness and, and attachment to these physical things. Unto the world leave now to be thrall. So, so leave, leave that, that uh, stop being a slave to this world. Cry him mercy, so ask for mercy that of his high goodness. So ask that, that of God's high uh, goodness made thee of naught. So ask uh, of ask him for mercy, who that that who in his high goodness made you of nothing, and in a special draw unto him and pray in general. So draw yourself to to this divine, and pray generally uh, for for yourself and for others um, for this heavenly reward. And truth we shall deliver. It is no greater. Okay. Um, hopefully that makes a little bit more sense. And this, I'll stop there. Any questions or comments on the poem itself? Now that we've kind of gone through through it, and hopefully this does it make a bit more sense now that we've paraphrased it a little? A show of hands. Does that maybe? Are, are there? Okay. Uh, good. Are there others that are still just confused? Uh, and maybe let me know in the comments if you're still with a question mark, if you're still, oh boy, just, I don't know where to start. It still doesn't make sense. Okay, so no question marks yet. Um, so I'll assume that the paraphrase has helped. Okay, good. Uh, someone's saying helps a lot, good. So we won't have to paraphrase as much with, with the modern translation that we're gonna read for Thursday. Um, so remember that uh, it is a bit of reading. So try to try to do the reading you can, so you don't get behind. Um, um, I think uh, we'll we'll do this type of paraphrasing again when we get to the Elizabethan sonnets. Uh, they're not translated, and uh, well, they're in they're in Eng more modern English, but they'll still be difficult because of the the poetic compression of expression that, that's in them. But we'll we'll do the same type of paraphrasing. Uh, also remember, so in addition to Thursday's reading, so you need to do the reading, and also for Friday, we'll need to do that uh, discussion forum post. Um, barring any other questions, and I don't see any at this point, that's it for now, and I'll see you on Thursday. Thank you.